Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Target's Chief Executive Officer, Brian Cornell. Well, good afternoon. I want to start today by answering what is, for many of us, a lifelong point of debate. Miller Lite. Does it taste great, or is it less filling? Back in the day, before iPhones, before Netflix, you couldn't watch a ball game in the 80s or the 90s without seeing these commercials. A bunch of ex-jocks arguing about something that is so obviously clear. It's not an either-or. It's both. But as silly as that debate was, it sounds a lot like the question everyone has right now about retail. Is it digital? Is it physical? The clear answer is that it's both. The future of retail is digital. And people will also be shopping in stores for a long, long time. But what will change is the interplay between the two channels. Because working together, well, it's just not enough. Consumers want us to pull the swim lanes out altogether. Because when they think about shopping at Target or anywhere else, well, it's all the same pool. People will shop the way they want. Our job is to be agile, offer rich expressions and experiences that let them really own it on their terms. And if we don't, well, someone else will. Now, I am hardly the first person to acknowledge this. Anyone with a brick and mortar business operation, well, you know this all too well. And if you started in e-commerce, you know that creating a physical presence where people can touch your products, well, it not only elevates the shopping experience, it strengthens your brand, and it broadens your reach. In fact, Andy Dunn, Bonomo's CEO, said much of that from this very stage last year. Then, just a few months later, he opened a shop near our headquarters in Minneapolis. I can tell you, it's beautiful. You walk in, you get measured up, and they ship the stuff to your house. It's a great model. At Target, our opportunity is fundamentally different. Depending on your scale or your market position, yours is different too. And there's lots of ways to come at this challenge. Melding the words and the worlds together, well, it's really easy when you're standing here on stage. But as we all know, it's really hard to do. So today, I thought I'd give you a look at how we're thinking about things at Target. But I can tell you, no matter where you are today, some of the fundamentals, well, they're universally true. You have to start by building a great brand. You have to offer products and services that are uniquely your own. You've got to aggressively invest in what differentiates you. And perhaps most importantly today, you have to make it really, really easy for your customers. So when most of you think about Target, you probably think about Target as a place. We're coast to coast. We've got over 1,800 stores. 30 million people visit us every week. So pick a number. Think about things five years from now. What percentage of all retail transactions will take place in a store? Will it be 80%, 75%, maybe 70? But whatever it's gonna be, it's still gonna be a really big number. So that means we've gotta keep investing in our stores to give our guests every possible reason to shop. And over the next few years, we're committed to spending billions of dollars to reimagine 
and to reposition our stores, turning them into showrooms designed to inspire our guests. Mike Troy, in his cover story, Retail Leader, said, probably said it best. He said, this is Target's big bet. And I can tell every person who's here today that I like that bet. Our guests like to shop. Our guests love that sense of discovery. They expect an elevated experience. So we need to create an environment that's worthy of their time. Today, we have some beautiful stores in our portfolio. But we also have some stores that today are really tired. And if you look across the competitive landscape, those folks who deferred investments, well, they're struggling. And customers, they get to vote with their feet. So you just can't be in the game. You have to invest. And at Target, we're doubling down. And we're fortunate enough to have the chips to do it. So for the better part of a year, we've been testing new innovation in stores across Los Angeles. And now we're going to simply take the best of the best, put it all together in our next generation prototype that we'll unveil later this year in Houston, Texas. Think about separate entrances, one that leads with inspiration in our home and apparel category, and one that's all about ease with food and beverage, order pickup, and essentials right there for the guest. Expect lots of flexibility, open sight lines, discovery moments throughout the store. We're going to take what we learn in Houston, and that'll guide us as we customize and remodel hundreds and hundreds of stores over the next three years. We're also not thinking about stores the same way we did even five years ago. And if we did, we'd be cooked. In this new era of retail, stores need to be multi-dimensional showrooms. They have to be destination for services. And more and more, we're positioning ours to function as guest-facing hubs in a smart network. Think of stores of the future, think of a Target store in the future as being a hyper-local, shoppable distribution center. This is where we see a tremendous competitive advantage, especially in places like Manhattan, where we just announced this morning we'll open up another incredible new store right in Herald Square. Today, 50% of Americans live less than four miles from one of our stores. I can tell you that is a huge competitive advantage. We think about last mile delivery. Turning these stores into fulfillment centers means we can ship orders twice as fast as we can from our traditional DCs. And cutting hundreds of miles out of the operation, well, that dramatically reduces our cost. It also means the inventory across the network, well, it's all for sale. Not just what's sitting in a warehouse. In the last three years, we've more than doubled our digital sales. From what was $1.4 billion back in 2013 to more than $3.4 billion last year. And I'm happy to report we're growing significantly faster than the industry trend. We were up 34% in the fourth quarter. In December alone, we grew by 40%. And that's in part because of the significant investments we made to re-platform our digital channels and to build industry-leading applications. But it's also because we literally turned our stores on. Today, our stores, well, they're driving our digital growth. They're fulfilling almost 55% of all of our digital orders. And as much as 80% during those key peak holiday periods. Order pickup, well, it drives incremental trips and it reduces our fulfillment cost. So we're going to continue to invest to unlock even greater value. We're testing things like same day delivery and scheduled delivery in a number of select markets this year. Again, as we look at the future, 
the advantage is in that network. If we're out of stock in one of our stores, or the guest is looking for a unique online exclusive style, we're arming our store teams with new tools to save the sale and check the guest out right there in the aisle. In isolation, you'd probably say each one of these tactics, not really game changing. But it's the sum of the capabilities that really elevates the experience and will drive market share gains going forward. Finally, as everyone here knows, there are just a few ways to stand apart in the retail environment. For some, it's all about price. For others, it's scarcity or perhaps speed. But one of Target's greatest points of differentiation has always been our exclusive brands and our limited time only partnerships, like our newest collaboration with Victoria Beckham. And in our business, you've got to keep it fresh. So our team's working hard to reimagine the entire brand portfolio. Over the next two years, we plan to launch more than a dozen new brands, $10 billion worth of product. And what you'll see with each one of those launch is a totally integrated experience across both physical and digital. We're dedicating landing pages to tell unique stories. We're elevating our site merchandising and leveraging social platforms like Pinterest to create even greater excitement. In store, we're elevating our visual, mer visual merchandising. We're investing in bold marketing and great new events, just the way we did when we launched Cat and Jack. We launched it this summer, and we've seen double-digit growth ever since. So no doubt, the future of retail, that big question all of you have been asking, well, it's going to be decided by the consumer, our customer, and the target guest. We're betting they're going to choose to shop in our stores. We're betting they'll choose to shop digitally. We're putting all of our chips around this big idea that the future retail will be the best of both worlds for years to come. So I appreciate your time this afternoon. And now I'd like to welcome CNBC's retail reporter, Courtney Reagan, who's going to join me on stage. And we'll spend a little bit more time talking about what the future of retail holds. Courtney. Hello, Brian. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much, Brian. I hope that everyone sort of followed along. That was a really nice overview and gives us a nice place to start because I'd like to hope that everyone watches CNBC and knows all of these updates in real time, but I understand they may not be as avid of watchers as you are. I know. So if we could just get started, you have a couple of announcements out today, so that gives us a nice place to start. Sure. Um, you talked a little bit and showed us some renderings of some new stores, but small format is going to be a really important part of Target's future. You said you're remodeling or refreshing 600, but you're going to open 100 small format stores. And one of them just happens to be in Herald Square, which is right across from the flagship Macy's store, right in that area, if you all are familiar. It's so, a pretty good location. So are you going after Macy's shoppers with that location? Well, we're going after market share right now. And when I talked to the financial community a couple of weeks ago, we said we are going to invest $7 billion of capital mm -hmm. and really make sure that we re revitalize our stores, revitalize our brand, move into new neighborhoods, elevate our digital capabilities and supply chain capabilities. And the real prize is all about market share. So as we sit here today in an environment that you report about every day, all the changes and disruption, I think for a company like ours, we're investing to win and winning is all about taking market share over the next few years. Wherever you can get it. Wherever we can get it. Online, but in store. When we move into these new neighborhoods, and you've been in a few of our stores, like Tribeca, customers come out. They're excited to see us. We're a part of the neighborhood. And we see opportunities to move into a number of neighborhoods across the United States. And certainly New York's been a big focus for us. But Herald Square, I expect, will be one of our best small format stores. Hmm. And so I want to talk about grocery for a second. It was, food was one of the pillars you spoke about a lot early on when you came to Target, saying that you needed to make some improvements. You made some improvements, but there was some disruption. It sort of disrupted traffic, it hit sales for a while, and you just announced that you've hired someone new 
to actually look over food and beverage. So what is your plan for food? You've said you don't want to be a grocer, but now it seems like it's a focus again. Well, it's always going to complement our core businesses. So, Courtney, our strategy is not going to change. We want to make sure that we really stand for those signature categories that we know our guests love to buy at Target. So we'll continue to focus on the importance of our style categories, elevating brands in apparel and home and beauty. We know how important baby and kids are. And while our guest is there, we want to make sure we offer them a great food experience. So one of the things we were testing in Los Angeles was updating not only the assortment and the improved quality, but the presentation in those stores. Mm -hmm. And as we bring that all to life, we're seeing a really positive response from our guests who's shopping for food and beverage. So we just brought in a terrific new executive. Uh, Jeff Burt's joining us after 30 years at Kroger, most recently as the president of Fred Meyer. He understands the food business from A to Z, and he's gonna bring great experience to help us continue to elevate our assortment, our presentation, our quality, leverage our supply chain investments to make sure that when you're shopping at Target and you're enjoying all those great new brands and the enhancements we're making, you're also going to have access to great food choices and clearly an expanded beverage assortment. So you touched a little bit on the, the LA tests. There were a number of those, but you also were reportedly working on a store of the future out in Silicon Valley, but those plans have been scrapped. That makes probably a lot of people here sad. Why did you scrap the store of the future? Robot infused, all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah. We made a tough choice. And as we think about the future, innovation is a really important part of it. If you see some of the things we're doing in small stores, what we're going to do in, down in Houston, all the new brands we're bringing forward, the amazing investments we're making to improve supply chain and technology. But our focus on innovation has to be something that we can realize over the next three or four years inside the core business. So there's some great new things that we'll continue to evaluate. We'll look around corners, but I want to make sure the innovation investments we're making are going to impact our business over the next two or three years. As we see this market share opportunity emerge, as we get our stores back into positive growth, as we continue to build off the momentum we have right now in digital, I want to make sure all of our innovation dollars are providing benefits in the near term that'll propel this company forward for years to come. And so right now you are spending a lot of money to improve the stores, but you're not ignoring your online operations. They're growing, as you gave us some of those numbers, double digit growth, 40% this last quarter. But it's still a relatively small piece of your business. It's 5%. That's below industry average. But it has gotten a lot bigger in the last couple of years. It has gotten bigger. And when you're growing at 30%, you know, you were seeing some really scale improvements. Would you ever look at a marketplace model for Target.com? Walmart's done it. Amazon yeah. clearly does it. Yeah, we're going to constantly look at ways to connect with our guests. And digital is a big part of it. So while we've talked about making significant investments in our stores, I really, again, I think about our stores as this new smart network. Sometimes you're going to shop them. Many, many times now you're ordering online and you're picking up in stores. As I said, our stores are fulfilling over 50% of our digital orders. And the fact that we're in everybody's neighborhood allows us to leverage that store differently. If you have a return, well, we're right down the street. So those stores are multi-dimensional now, and they're gonna help us drive digital growth. During the holidays, I just talked about it, we talked about it a couple weeks ago. We had certain days where our stores were fulfilling 80% of our digital orders. So the stores and digital, well, they gotta work hand in hand. This last three quarters have been interesting for Target. Second quarter was not so great. Third quarter was better. You actually took up your guidance, and then we had the holidays, and it was disappointing. You're two months into this quarter. How's it going now? Well, we're two months in, so I can't talk about it. Oh, come on, just a but little bit. No one will tell. We, we've seen really positive strides over really the last few years. And we've been delivering flat or positive comps in seven of the last nine quarters. So there's certain things that are working really well. Our signature categories, we're taking share in apparel and home. I feel really good about that. Mm -hmm. And we're making improvements that are showing up in digital growth of you know, over 30%. So we're going to continue to make sure we're investing in the future. We're elevating our brand. We're really excited about our new limited time offer with Victoria Beckham. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to drive a lot of excitement to our stores and visits to our site. And we're going to invest in the long haul and make sure that we emerge as one of the future retail winners. So we're in Las Vegas. People have talked about this being Target's big bet. 
I really like this bet. And it's a bet in that I'm placing around our team, around our brand, around our future capabilities, and our ability to make sure that we emerge as one of the future winners in retail. Something else that you and I have talked about, but I haven't heard talked about that much here at this conference, is the new Trump administration. There are new proposals that may come to the table that have to do with border adjustment tax, um, that have to do with different so sorts of tax reform and a number of other things. So I think it's really important for the audience to understand what would happen to Target's financial picture if a border adjustment tax were passed? Yeah. Well, you know, I've been very active in Washington, D.C. this year, mm -hmm. and we've had a number of meetings. We've been actually tracking them. I think I've been in 27 different meetings around corporate tax reform and some of the changes that are being discussed, the House plan, some of the responses that we're seeing the Senate work on. Certainly had an opportunity with a number of other CTO, uh, retail CEOs to talk to the president. I think what people now understand, and you've done a great job of reporting on this, is if this goes forward as currently proposed, it's the consumer in the United States that's going to pay for it. They're going to pay for it because there are going to be higher prices for apparel and home goods and other items that they buy, those core school supplies that I think you reported on so accurately. And for a company like ours and many other retailers, if we can't deduct all of the items we import, it puts us in a really difficult position. I mean, today we pay a full fare, just about 35%. As we've looked at it, if this goes forward, we'd be paying an effective tax rate of over 75%. And you've talked to some of my retail peers who have said numbers are even higher than that. Yep. So it's not the right thing for American families. It's not the right thing for the retail industry. And I think we're going to find a different plan that works for, for everyone. Thank you so much, Brian. I want to keep Thank going, you, but the red light's already flashing, so I guess we're done. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Brian Cornell, Thank good to you. see Appreciate you as it. well.